40 years ago, a new magazine suddenly appeared on the market called Astronomy. And it promised to be the most beautiful magazine ever published about astronomy. And it has lived up to its name. And so tonight, I thought it would be marvelous to share some of the grand discoveries that Astronomy Magazine has seen, that ones that they thought were noteworthy for humanity to recognize and understand. But there was also another reason. I became acquainted with David Eicher through his drawings of galaxies that he did through his telescope. He is now the editor of Astronomy Magazine. He's here from Waukesha, enjoying our beautiful skies, our beautiful restaurants, and more than anything else, the history that is right here, all around us here at the Center for Astrophysics. So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce David Eicher, Editor-in-Chief, Astronomy Magazine. We actually published our 40th anniversary issue of the magazine a few months ago in August here. Um, and it's actually been around, David's right, it's been around for 40 years now. And we did in this issue a number of lookbacks at sort of great discoveries and other things of the past. And so I, I have to make a confession to you right away, and that is I'm cheating you tonight. Um, we're only going to do 10 great astronomical discoveries, and that's because David wanted me also to talk about comets. So we'll do that afterwards. So we're going to do sort of two pieces here, um, and then we can talk questions and, and whatever we would like to do. But as we probably know, as many of you do, uh, scientifically, uh, we hit a rough spot here in the civilization on Earth, and that was about in the 5th century. Uh, up until, oh, about the 15th century, the Dark Ages, from a scientific standpoint, really arrested clever thought. Um, that had been going on, sort of bubbling up in the Greek times and the Roman times. And it wasn't until some clever fellows like this guy, Nicholas Copernicus, uh, came along um, that we really started to propel forward in a big way our scientific understanding of where we are in the universe and what the universe means to us as humans on Earth. Well, in, four, in 1543, uh, specifically, Copernicus published his famous on the revolutions of the celestial spheres. And he, of course, placed the sun uh, at the center of the, solar, of the universe, if you will, solar system, universe at the time. This was a revolutionary act, of course, that got him into, uh, it, it did not win Nicholas Copernicus the most popular guy of 1543 award, particularly with the church. But uh, it did lead to a major um, upturn in the clear understanding of what was happening in our universe. The Earth and other planets were orbiting the sun, and the heliocentric model of Copernicus um, ultimately won out. It took a little time, but it ultimately won out. This is actually a facial reconstruction of Copernicus uh, based on the 2005 discovery, by the way, of that which is to believe believed to be uh, Copernicus's body. So this is a great, generally thought to be what he looked like pretty accurately. Well, everyone was minding their own business for a time again. And in 1609, Galileo um, had heard about, uh, to his horror, about the invention of some cheap pocket telescopes that were actually for sale on the streets of Paris of all things. This horrified him because he was one of these smart guys, as a lot of them were back then, polymaths, interested in this, that, and everything. Mathematician, physicist, astronomer, natural philosopher. And it was always his dream to construct such a telescope. He ran home, uh, reinvented the telescope based on what he had heard about what existed uh, commonly, and uh, convinced the Doge in Venice and everyone else that this was a brilliant thing, of course, for military operations. But he also, one fateful night in the fall of 1609, turned this newfound telescope uh, from the church steeple in Padua, Italy, where he lived, over to the moon and made the first astronomical telescopic widely influential uh, uh, observation. Um, a few other people had looked skyward with one before that. But uh, cleverly, in, a few months later in 1610, Galileo observed Venus, which you can see his drawings of below uh, Saturn and, and some other things like that. 
Venus, he noticed, uh, significantly had phases in a telescope that mimicked uh, those of the moon. And this was a big, big deal because uh, he thought about it very carefully and very cleverly. And it turned out that these gibbous phases of Venus proved that Venus had to be inward toward the sun from Earth and that Earth could not be in the center of the universe or solar system. And therefore, the heliocentric model was found uh, to have much more support. Uh, if the geocentric, if Earth were in the middle of everything, as we all thought, you know, all this time beforehand, uh, Venus would be a crescent, of course. Um, then along came a fellow who was a little bit crazy, brilliant crazy, uh, Isaac Newton, and in 1687, published uh, his Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, another great leap forward in astronomical, in scientific, in the history of physics, uh, in the whole ball of wax, uh, Principia for short in Latin, from the Latin, original Latin title. And this was a big, big deal because there was no universal system of understanding the world, the universe, the stars, and what governed them until Newton's publication of this landmark book. This really laid out the laws of motion, of universal gravitation, of all of the principles that we still hold in slightly different ways, in some cases dear today. And it also, again, reinforced a convincing proof of how planets orbit the sun. It also led significantly in something that still not everybody buys, at least on Facebook, that the physical laws that we observe in the universe, physics, chemistry, astronomy, etc., cetera, et cetera, apply throughout the universe, which is kind of a drag, I know, for science fiction. It's not as much fun to believe in the hard stuff. But as we understand it, Newton is still correct. Well. Then a guy came along, fast forward a little later, Edmund Halley, um, and he was interested in all sorts of things. He was, again, a very clever fellow, observed lots of comets among this and that, and he uh, was particularly interested in the historical records that were not terribly accurate at the time um, that related to several comets uh, that had been observed in 1531, 1607, and 1682, uh, and he realized that they possess similar orbits. And so in 1705, Halley uh, deduced that these three comets were actually the same comet uh, that were returning uh, around the sun. This was a breakthrough understanding at the time, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the comets half of this talk. But uh, he also predicted the return of this comet in 1758, and by golly, the comet returned and ultimately was designated now in the modern system of comets 1P Halley, which means it's a periodic comet. It comes back. Uh, that's what the P stands for. Uh, and it bears his name and certainly is the most famous comet of all time. And you may have seen it in its last operation, uh, apparition in which we got robbed, of course, uh, in 1985 and 1986 because it was not a very good apparition in terms of the geometry of where the comet was. So they did a little bit better in 1910 and at other times, but hey, we still got to see it. You know, it's not all bad. Well, there was this fellow uh, around about the time of uh, just after the turn of the century and the uh, run-up to World War I, a fellow named Harley, Harlow Shapley. In fact, he was a pretty well-known guy uh, right here um, at this institution, um, one of the greatest uh, directors uh, of this observatory and, and greatest astronomers uh, in the United States history. Um, he was a guy, again, who was involved in all sorts of clever thinking. Um, he studied the positions in the World War I and just before then era of one thing that he was interested in, which was globular star clusters. So these are big balls of very old stars that orbit that are fairly distant. We didn't know what the distances were exactly yet at that time, but Shapley studied the positions very carefully for the first time of the then known 93 globular clusters uh, and in, that turned out to be in our Milky Way galaxy. These are old, old stars that exist in, in globes of 
as many as a million suns held together by gravity. Um, and he didn't know this at the time, but, but uh, now we know that they are remnant blobs of gas that accreted, that formed, that were pulled in and did not get sucked into the disk of our Milky Way galaxy, but orbit at larger distances. Well, he found that they form a spherical population centered on a spot in the sky um, around the constellation Sagittarius, and he measured the distances very carefully of these clusters and found out that they were between, mo mostly, that th this uh, spot was mostly between, of concentration was mostly between 25 and 30 thousand light years from us. So from that he deduced that that was the Milky Way's center and that these clusters were orbiting the center of our galaxy. And the light bulb began to go on here at this observatory about the definition of what our galaxy, our star system, that we now know holds two, three, or four hundred billion stars, including the sun, what it's made of. So that was another big moment. Well, then this guy came along. You know, he'd been around already uh, making trouble. Posing for pictures, this is a much later picture, of course, but uh, it's everyone's favorite Einstein picture, I think. But, but then uh, he really made trouble um, earlier with this, the special theory of relativity, but especially in 1916 with the theory of so-called general relativity, that for the first time since Newton really revolutionized our understanding of space and time as concepts and how the universe works. Einstein explained gravity as a warping of the space-time fabric, if you will, that makes up our universe. Uh, and this is really the best way, general relativity still, that we have to describe and understand the structure, the history, the evolution of the universe. Still holds up pretty well. It explains black holes, gravitational redshifts. Uh, it explains the bending of light around massive objects from distant objects behind them. Uh, it explains lots and lots of things very nicely. Um, of course, there are still a few questions here and there about exactly how relativity works and observations that at times may appear to defy it. But science is not any longer about eureka moments and big immediate discoveries. I know even in a world of daily blogs, it's about a slow gradual accumulation of knowledge and testable experiments and relativity holds up very, very well to all of those tests. Well, in 1923, this uh, another extraordinary American astronomer, Edwin Hubble, came along. He was interested in these things that were called spiral nebulae uh, that had been observed and noticed uh, for decades back into the 1830s when a very famous fellow uh, who actually had the largest telescope in the world of all places in rural Ireland, the third Earl of Ross, um, and he sketched these arms, very nice spiral arms of these nebulae uh, back in the 1840s, beginning then. Uh, but nobody really understood these nebulae very well until Hubble in 1923 using the 100-inch Hooker telescope at Mount Wilson near Los Angeles. Uh, he imaged, uh, the, um, this is the Andromeda Nebula in 1923 terms, which now we know is the Andromeda Galaxy, of course. He imaged uh, this plate of, of the center of the galaxy and looked at a couple of novae that are indicated there, these, these exploding stars. Um, and he also found a variable star of a very specific type, and it's marked with the VAR at the top of the image there and circled or, or, or uh, highlighted with a red box. Well, Hubble employed the very famous relationship that had been created in this building several years earlier. Uh, by Henrietta, Henrietta Swan Leavitt and others um, that explained the period luminosity relationship, that is the uh, brightness of this particular kind of variable star over time in a very clear pattern called a Cepheid variable star after Delta Cephei, the prototype star in the constellation Cepheus. And Hubble recognized that as a Cepheid variable star. It was so faint, however, 
and the absolute brightness of these stars is so well known that he was stunned and you can see he put an exclamation point on this notation because he realized that M31 was not a nebula within our Milky Way but it was many 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 times farther away to explain how faint this Cepheid variable star was. So this was a huge breakthrough in 1923 that explained the, for the first time, hinted at the enormous distance scale of the universe being much, much larger than anyone had ever guessed and also hinted for the first time at the nature of galaxies being separate island universes, if you will, of stars, gas, and dust. Well, another interesting time, moment of discovery, came along uh, in 1963, uh, quite a few decades later, with the discovery of what came to be known as quasars. Martin Schmidt uh, at uh, Caltech uh, observed a number, along with others, of these very strange, extraordinarily bright radio-emitting objects in the sky. This is one of them here called 3C273, after its catalog designation and you can see a background galaxy there at the bottom and he called them quasi-stellar objects because they were point-like like stars but extremely bright and had very peculiar spectra the kind of wavelengths of light that they were emitting uh, and so he saw that the various lines of emission in the spectrum of this object uh, were not very bizarre and very strange after all, but they were actually just shifted uh, toward the red end of the spectrum, which is an effect of cosmic expansion, so-called red shifts. So he saw that these were, uh, similarly to M31, were extraordinarily far away, um, yet they were very bright. Um, and he didn't know what this was, but now, many years later, we've come to know that these were the very energetic centers of young galaxies, most of them, uh, in which black holes are eating up a lot of material, these very, very dense regions of space in which uh, lots of matter has fallen in and the gravitational attraction is so strong that nothing can escape the black hole. Um, and material that's falling into this black hole gets accelerated at very, very fast speeds, shot out, and you can see this jet coming down to the lower right of the quasar is that jet of material coming sort of toward us. So this was another major revelation that young galaxies um, possess these black holes and are extraordinarily bright in the early universe because as we look at very distant objects, of course, we're looking back in time. Well, another big one was 1965, the cosmic microwave background radiation. This was a discovery made accidentally at Bell Labs by Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, and Robert Wilson is indeed also here at this institution. This is a, of course, a hall of superstars in the world of astronomy and astrophysics here. Um, this image is actually a recent one from the P European Planck satellite, um, uh, which I'll explain in a second, but they found that there was a faint glow over the whole sky in the microwave region of the spectrum that was very, very strange. Uh, and after a lot of analysis and research, it turned out to be the echo, uh, the temperature echo, if you will, of the Big Bang, uh, the, the formation of the universe. So this was a big one as well. The universe at this, uh, by now, has cooled to 2.7 kelvins, which is about 4.9 degrees Fahrenheit above absolute zero. So we're talking about pretty small temperatures here. Nonetheless, um, it was detectable. And this shows, this is a temperature map that's from this year, from the Planck satellite of the Big Bang Echo. Well, just when we thought that everything was nicely coming together in terms of our understanding of astronomy and astrophysics, in 1998, two different research groups uh, we're looking at very, very distant supernovae, uh, massive exploding stars, and announced uh, that they'd found a very, very strange thing. The universe is not only expanding from the Big Bang on a large scale, everything moving, of course, apart from everything else, but the rate of expansion in the universe is increasing over time, and nobody knows why. Does anybody know what, exactly what dark energy is? Have you read about this? 
Because if you know what, it, I'm, I'm glad you, you passed the test. You're honest. Because if you do know what it is, you could probably bring home a Nobel Prize next year. A lot of cosmologists and astrophysicists are working on this question now, and nobody knows what this is, except that they call it dark energy because it's a force uh, that is pushing the expansion of the universe apart in an accelerating way. They call the repulsive force, as I mentioned, dark energy. Um, and these distant supernovae of a particular type, called type 1a supernovae, again were found to be, in this case now, fainter than their distances would apply. And therein lies the rub and, and the problem. So a lot of what we understand about cosmology and frankly what the universe is made of now is in a big uh, quandary and in some doubt. The stuff that we're made of, um, so-called normal, so-called baryonic matter, uh, is just a few percent of the universe. Uh, planets, galaxies, stars, cats, dogs, trees, lawnmowers. Um, there's a, about 23% of the universe, because remember from Einstein, uh, uh, mass and energy are interconvertible, are the same thing in different forms, uh, from E equals mc squared. The, about 23% of the universe is dark matter, and that's a whole other story too, and we don't completely understand what it is, but 70-some percent of the universe is this dark energy, which we have no idea what it is. And so the, good, the upside here is it's going to keep cosmologists employed for some time to come. Um, and now for comets. Uh, David, you wanted me to speak about uh, comets a little bit as well, because we've got a reasonably bright comet uh, here. And we've heard things, again, we live in this world of blogs and of everybody jumping on to the latest. got to be hot news stories every day. And we've heard about this comet that's coming, ISON, which is an acronym, which I'll explain in a moment, that it's going to be the brightest comet anyone on Earth has ever seen. You know, flaming scimitar. And we've also heard recently that it's fizzled. And it's going to, you're not even going to be able to see it, even though it's still twice as far from the sun as we are. And comets, to, to warm up and to outgas and create a tail and so on, they need to be close to the sun. So um, there, there are people who are hedging their bets on this. I took the safe way out. Uh, uh, I published a new book about comets <laughs> before it got here. And so you, you can call me a, you know, a chicken if you want, but this is a, you know, a shameless plug. This is a new, I only have one copy, but there will be copies of this book in bookstores in two to three weeks. If you're interested in reading about comets, it's published by Cambridge University Press, and it talks a little bit about, about comet ice on just about that much, and a whole lot about all the other comets. So there you go. But there's a lot of exciting stuff that we know about comets and that we've learned over the last 10 to 15 years. Who thinks that comet Ison is going to fizzle completely? Yes, sir? Does anyone think it's going to be fantastically bright? Yes? So most of you are smart and you're hedging your bets because <laughs> we're not really going to know for about another four to six weeks. But we'll see. Anyway, it was discovered uh, about a year ago um, it's going to have its perihelion, that is the closest point to the sun, um, on November 28th. And I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We have a state religion in Wisconsin. It's called the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> and this perihelion moment when the comet is closest to the sun happens during halftime on Thanksgiving <laughs> of the Packers-Lions game. Now, I say, they, they say there are no coincidences in the universe. <laughs> Come on. It's going to be good. That's no accident. Okay. So you can run out, and at that point, it's actually going to be a few degrees away from the sun in the daytime sky. Now, daytime comets are not, uh, they're extraordinary, but they have happened before. Um, but it's possible if this thing is as bright as the Minor Planet Center thinks it will be, and that is about as bright as Venus at its brightest now, minus 4.5 magnitude, you may be, if you're very, 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 very careful, you may be able to go out and actually block the disk of the sun with your hand or, you know, the shoe that you've thrown at the TV if you're a Lions fan. 
and see the comet a few degrees away from the sun in a daytime sky. But at worst, this thing, even if it's not nearly as bright as it's supposed to be, it'll be a pretty good naked eye comet in the morning sky on the run up to late November. And in the morning, and because the geometry and evening sky, you'll be able to see it partially in each following that in December. And it ought to be a good naked eye comet, um, even if it's not the brightest comet anyone now is alive has ever seen, kind of a thing. So anyway, it ought to be roughly in the range of naked eye visibility by Halloween. Um, it uh, will be brightest, as I mentioned, in November. Uh, well, what I, exactly, it could be the next great comet, as they say. There's no definition officially of what a great comet is, but a number of things make comets really, really great. It's that thing that your, you know, your Aunt Martha, who's never seen a comet, goes out and says, wow, you know, just looking up at it. That's a great comet. Or maybe she even says something even stronger, you know, especially if you give her a cocktail beforehand. Um, so some of the things that make comets great are perihelion distance, are, are the distance from the sun, the distance from Earth, the physical size, that the comets, they're blocks of ice uh, of various types, and they can be smaller than a kilometer or as large as 60 kilometers, which is the nucleus of comet Hale-Bopp, which some of you may have seen in 1996 and 7. That's the largest physical comet known which is part of why it was so bright. It's freshness. There's a very distant reservoir called the Oort Cloud, after another famous guy. Um, there's also a, a closer uh, disk of comets called the Kuiper Belt, of not quite as fresh comets. Uh, the amount of dust in comets. Some comets, it's clear now, are sort of rubble piles, the nuclei held together loosely like a bunch of frozen ice gravel, rather than big, solid uh, chunks of ice. So what exactly are comets? Well, another local hero, you know, you don't have to go very long to stumble over them here, Fred Whipple, uh, who is, of course was here and is a great, great figure in planetary science and astronomy. In 1950, he devised the so-called dirty snowball model of what comets are. They have a nucleus, that is, they're a frozen block of water, ice, of carbon monoxide, of carbon dioxide, uh, methane, acetylene, uh, ethane, no, if you get some comet stuff, you can't melt it and drink it. Okay, don't try that. Um, ammonia, all sorts of other nasty stuff, and lots of dust. They also have things called Chon particles, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen rich uh, particles from the early solar system, and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. That's a fancy name for tar. You know, planetary scientists like big words. You know, everybody does. It makes it sound better, doesn't it? You know, but that's what that is. Um, it's very incredible because in the only comet that's been sampled with a return back to Earth, Comet Vilt 2, uh, astronomers found glycine, which is a complicated uh, compound, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. They have a coma, that is, the ice goes in sub by sublimation from a frozen solid directly into a gas with no liquid phase for the most part. Uh, they have an ion or a gas tail that tends to be bluish, a dust tail that tends to be more yellow, and an occasional anti-tail that points sunward, which is a complicated story. Well, going back to history, we didn't really talk much about this specifically with comets, but the idea of how the universe is made up goes back principally to Aristotle in the beginning with those four elements or layers of the universe. And comets were thought to be in the upper or the fiery sphere of the universe. Seneca the Younger uh, in Rome uh, was ahead of his time as a sort of a brilliant thinker about comets and what they may be, but not too many people picked up on that. Claudius Ptolemy in Egypt then worked on the uh, orbits of things and how they moved uh, in the solar system, but that didn't really go anywhere and we had to wait for 1,600 years, really, uh, for a modern understanding of comets. Tycho Brahe, Danish nobleman and astronomer, observed the Great Comet of 1577 and was the first one to realize that comets were so-called supralunar, were beyond the moon from his calculations. Um, 
Until then, they were thought to be emanations. They were thought to be vapors or gases rising up from Earth and in Earth's atmosphere until 1577. And it wasn't until a couple of decades later and change that Johannes Kepler, um, his assistant and inheritor, uh, came up with his laws of planetary motion that really explained the orbits of comets and lots of other things. Then Galileo observed a lot of comets. The polymath Robert Hooke, uh, English brilliant guy, uh, observed comets in 1664 and 5, just enough to argue violently um, with his good friend Isaac Newton and accuse Newton of stealing his ideas for Principia, um, which Newton didn't do, but it led to a good story. And finally, Isaac Newton, um, in the 17th uh, century, um, solved the riddle of how comets move in the solar system uh, and where, began to understand where they live. Comets live in a variety of places in the solar system. They are long period comets with uh, periods greater than 200 years. Short period comets less than 200 years, not surprisingly. That, in, that includes a Halley top co a type comets and Jupiter family comets that are all in the region and within the orbital uh, radius of Jupiter. There are also main belt comets that are uh, cometary objects that are near the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. There are so-called sun grazers and Ison is, going, is a sun grazer that's coming in on a very close path to the sun and in a hyperbolic orbit and then will be gone forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. So if you're going to see that, you've got to see it this time. The Kuiper belt is this inner disk that was only discovered in the 1990s, uh, and that's in the region of Pluto and a short distance beyond. There is also, and that may account for some tens of thousands of cometary nuclei in that region, there's also a region beyond it called the scattered disk in which some of these Kuiper belt objects got spun up into crazy orbits by Jupiter and Neptune and uh, are doing all sorts of funny things. Uh, and then, of course, there's the Oort cloud, which is a long, long way off. Um, something that we don't realize really in talking about all this stuff is the distance scale of the universe and even of the solar system, which is, in a word, large. Um, the Oort cloud, which could be argued, you know, we just heard that Voyager 1 left the solar system because of the heliopause that it passed through and you can read all about that. Uh, but if we're looking at the physical gravitational family of the sun moving along with it, the uh, Oort cloud extends to about 100,000 astronomical units. That's 100,000 100, times farther away than we are from the sun. Voyager 1 is 125 astronomical units away from us now. So in one sense, it's a bit of a stretch to claim that it has left the building. Um, comets have cousins called asteroids. They were formerly, until about 20 years ago, thought to be completely different from comets in every way, shape, and form. Now it's clear that uh, comets and asteroids are both part of small icy bodies in the solar system. And there's a population, for example, of centaurs, so-called half-asteroid, half-comets. Uh, a fair number of those are known. Many probably exist. Uh, some asteroids are... are clearly defunct comets because of their uh, orbits and the way comets die and run out of material. Uh, some comets, of course, were thought to be asteroids. So comets and asteroids, the, line, the clean lines between those things have blurred. Uh, quickly, I'll talk about, because I don't want to run too long, spacecraft missions to comets. Uh, we've only visited a small number of comets with spacecraft, and that's really how we know about the physical parameters of comets, is only visiting just a few. The first spacecraft missions uh, came in 85 and 6 with Halley. Uh, Deep Space 1 in 2001 uh, uh, visited uh, Comet Borelli. The Stardust mission uh, visited Vilt 2 in 2006 and returned a sample. And it's exciting because the only sample that we have of comets contain the amino acid glycine, which is the simplest of all amino acids, but it's a building block of, of, of proteins and the stuff of life, you could argue, complex organic molecules. The only sample of a comet that we've ever seen contained one of the several hundred 
amino acids, the stuff of life, if you will, exists in comets out in the Oort cloud, presumably. Uh, Deep Impact in 2005 sent a probe smashing into Temple One. Uh, Epoxy visited Hartley in 2010, and Stardust next Temple One again. Well, let's talk for just one second about near-Earth objects, and if you want to lie awake at night, you can know that until recently, the complete number of astronomers who were monitoring asteroids and or comets that are close to Earth and could intersect with Earth amounts to the same number of people as a day shift at a McDonald's. <laughs> but nonetheless, over the last few years, we have a pretty good handle on what's out there close to Earth. Long ago, it was a very violent place here where we are because the so-called late heavy bombardment took place with many, many small bodies slamming into Earth. Uh, we, of course, know about the K, now it's called the KPG impact, the dinosaur killer in the Yucatan 66 million years ago, uh, wiped out uh, nearly all life on Earth, uh, except for our forebears. Tunguska in 1908 was either a cometary nucleus that exploded or an asteroid that flattened and pancaked and exploded over the Siberian forest, knocking down a huge number of trees over an enormous area. This past year, we had, uh, thanks to the um, Russian um, window cam video industry, we had a fantastic time seeing the Chelyabinsk fireball, which uh, was a very small object, but uh, these things are out there and will continue to come in. There are about 400 tons per day of cometary and or asteroidal debris that come into Earth's atmosphere. Most of it doesn't make it to the surface, and most of that which does uh, falls into the ocean, but there still is a lot of stuff out there coming in. We know that a 10 kilometer object through modeling is a civilization killer, so we definitely want to avoid that or it ruins your week. Um, there, there's been a lot of research recently in the last five to ten years about whether comets delivered the water to Earth to create our oceans. And for a long time, the basic answer was, well, yeah, it sounds good. Comets are made nearly out of, you know, entirely out of water. Um, and there were a lot of them around and a lot of heavy bombardment in the early solar system. They must have. And that was essentially the line of reasoning. Um, recently, however, looking at a bunch of stuff uh, that I won't subject you to thoroughly, but the, one of them is the ratio of deuterium to hydrogen in comets versus the ocean water on Earth. It's pretty clear that comets did not provide most of the water uh, that we started out with on this planet. There's a lot of water on Earth, um, even though not a lot by mass. But for where we are compared to the sun, we're exceedingly rich in water. It now turns out, however, that about 10 to 15 percent of our ocean water probably came from comets, and believe it or not, the rest of it came from icy rich asteroids. And even from water molecules adhering in the inner solar system, which was hot to begin with, to dust grains that accreted into Earth to make our planet. Well, I mentioned. Uh, did comets seed life on Earth? I mentioned glycine, other important uh, organic molecules, this primitive tarry stuff and Chon particles. Lots of this stuff of organics exist in comets. A number of people, including the uh, irascible astronomer Fred Hoyle, believed for a long time in, in a concept called panspermia, in which organic life, bacteria and so on, were actually raining down throughout the galaxy in the solar system uh, and that the galaxy seeded life on Earth. That's probably not thought to be true, and I won't go through the whole thing here because I think we want to leave enough time for questions. Um, but we do know, as I mentioned, that the stuff of life exists in comets, the one that we have sampled, and almost undoubtedly others. Well, just to finish here, let's talk about the numbers game with comets as we look forward to Ison, either the spectacular, brilliant wonder of our lives, or, you know, stay in and watch, you know, Doc Dynasty instead. You know, it's not worth it. Um, but it's, the numbers are pretty incredible. The Oort cloud, our outer shell of comets, which extends, by the way, about 40% of the way to the nearest star. That's how large that cloud of comets is. 
Astronomers now think that there are about two trillion cometary nuclei in the Oort cloud attached to our solar system gravitationally. That's a whole lot of them. And when a star passes near us through the Oort cloud, or other things gravitationally influence the cloud, i.e. things called giant molecular clouds, or actually the gravitational tug of the rotation of the galaxy itself, that sends comets inward toward the sun, kicks them inward, and one comes in like Ison and visits us and we get a treat. There are about 4,200 comets known specifically, about uh, a little more than a third of those are sun grazers like Ison and others. Uh, the nuclei of comets we now know are very dark. They're nearly as dark as coal. They have a very low density. Um, some are rubble piles, as I mentioned, and comets that are fairly far off from in the outer solar system are reddish, have a reddish mantle of stuff on them from being exposed to radiation. Well, even if we don't have a bright comet every night of the year, we had a pretty good one earlier this year, PANSTAR is one of the PANSTAR's comets. We hope we'll have a pretty good one again coming soon. But you can see the effects of comets uh, on many, many nights a year. If, if you get away from the city and go out and look up and see a meteor shower, or even a stray meteor or two, because meteor streams are the detritus, are the debris, are the leftover junk from comets as they lose material and eventually die and go into the become asteroids that we no longer care about so much. So these meteor streams that intersect Earth's orbit and when they do produce an annual meteor shower like the Perseids or the Geminids or the Leonids are the stuff of comets that we can go out and see tiny little particles, most of them sand grain, no larger than pea size, that zip into Earth or pull down and, and light up the sky and we can make a wish. So comets are often with us uh, even when there's not a bright comet in the sky that we can see with our naked eye binoculars or telescope. So with that, I would uh, thank you very, very much for having me here. You've been a great audience. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, and I, well, thank you. And I don't know if you have any questions. Thank you.